Welcome to Out of the Blank. Welcome back to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. Mr. Paul Grain, it's a pleasure to see you again, have you back on the show. I know we just talked yesterday. It was nice. I enjoyed our little chat. But something recently you sent me, which was about the UN investigation into Dag Hammarskjöld's death um, and how Alan Dulles might have been one of the people that have got him killed, much like with Patrice Lumumba. And I think this conversation, we can learn a little bit more about Dag Hammarskjöld's death because I doubt a lot of people even looked into that or know much about who that character is. And also... The JFK versus Alan Dulles book that you have um, when it comes to Indonesia and a lot of people, I think me and you have talked about in the past that Indonesia is kind of a place that people can't really point to on a map, let alone talk about the intersection between Alan Dulles and JFK. So being a Kennedy uh, discussion, let's start off with the first question, which would just be JFK and Alan Dulles. This is a relationship that's been, you know back and forth kind of seems like they hated each other. Kennedy eventually fired Alan Dulles and then Alan Dulles was appointed to the Warren Commission to investigate Kennedy's death. So the beginning though, starting off with the debates, Alan Dulles was on JFK's side. And you mentioned to me something yesterday, which I think is pretty important about Alan Dulles writing the scripts for Kennedy. And he did. Well, he helped him with the television interview on Cuba and, uh, Sorensen, that's uh, the speechwriter for Kennedy. Sorensen later wrote in his book uh, that it was that television interview that really uh, turned the tide and got a lot of people supporting Kennedy as a result. And Nixon, conversely, sort of fell by the wayside and he lost the eventual counts in the presidential election were very close, very close. And Sorensen said that particular interview helped Kennedy to get over the line. So he he was indebted in that respect to the help that he, he did receive from Alan Dulles beforehand, a little bit on the quiet. And uh, Nixon really resented it in later years and wrote a book, sort of uh, accusing him of uh, yeah, helping the helping the opposition, which is a bit blunt. Yeah, but I mean. Richard Nixon was helped in, he started on the West Coast, I think, didn't he? As a lawyer there, and, and Dulles was the man who helped him up from in the early 50s. He got him into the, uh, helped him into the vice presidential position under Eisenhower. And he was always, always really under the thumb, I, I suppose you could say, of, of Alan Dulles. So much so that when Richard Nixon came to visit Alan Dulles, he was dying in his own house upstairs. And it was in 1969, I think. And uh, Alan Dulles told Nixon, OK, the election, presidential election's coming up. Now it's your turn. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing that he could say such a thing. And that's when Nixon was finally elected. But he, he would have preferred, I think, to have been elected instead of Kennedy. <laughs> he probably uh, would have done better with all the tactics, you know, like all the stuff that came out during Watergate and kind of all the evil stuff that gets talked about about Nixon. I feel like if he was president when he was going against Kennedy, if he would have won that election, we probably wouldn't know all this stuff. It probably would have been normal. It seemed like it was that was the time to do what he was doing, but he did it later. And it seemed like the tides were changing during the 70s and kind of pushing more towards a different activist anti-government era. But the reason... The real reason why Alan Dulles helped Kennedy, a Democrat, was that he knew how Kennedy would react in that situation that he that Dulles had set up, the anti-colonial dispute over sovereignty of West New Guinea. Kennedy was the man, the right man, or better than Nixon, according to according to uh, Dulles anyway, because he would promote an anti-colonial sentiment and give or force the Dutch out and and give uh, West New Guinea to. Stukano, which is what he did. He was he was convinced he didn't want to have a superpower conflict with the with the Moscow either. So that, that was perhaps a key factor. 
Do you think but, Alan Dulles was banking on the fact that Kennedy was going to start going to all these countries and trying to make them independent? Like that seems like a big problem for Alan Dulles, especially if we talk about the gold mine that was in Indonesia. Uh, we talked about this yesterday a little bit, but I mean, that's a problem. Nixon seems like not the type that would want to go with Alan Dulles or whatever he was trying to do with Indonesia. He seemed like a complete opposite. That's the only way I can think of a, heart or a Republican like Alan Dulles going for a Democrat like Kennedy was that if he could muscle him over somehow with some of his tactics because he was new to office. Well, Dulles is, uh, operates in a very subtle way, really. Uh, blunt sometimes, but subtle, very subtle otherwise. He wanted Sukarno Dulles would have preferred Sukarno to take over West New Guinea, which is which is what happened, with with Kennedy's assistance, with Kennedy was Kennedy's decision to to go in that way, mainly because Sukarno only had thirty months left as president as president thirty months, so he he didn't Sukarno didn't enjoy the the benefits of West New Guinea at all. It was a it was a colonial victory. But it was really, you could say almost at the same time, that as soon as Tucano gained uh, sovereignty of West New Guinea, well, it wasn't sovereignty, it was control of West New Guinea, his, the, 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 uh, the, the clock started ticking for Tucano because his, his time as president was really limited from that time on. And he, he only lasted another 30 months, you see, after after the Dutch were ousted from New Guinea, and then Suharto took control of West New Guinea. And that's what that's really what Alan Dulles wanted because it was a military regime and uh, uh, they really had uh, a close connection with, with uh, Suharto. Uh, Suharto gave the uh, Rockefeller Company Freeport Indonesia, it was eventually called, uh, it, gave them, it gave them 10 years tax-free holiday really when, when they started mining the gold straight away they had uh done a lot of preparation for mining the gold and they had equipment there men there waiting waiting throughout the 60s but they didn't really begin until that final decision in 1969 they call it the act of free choice when indonesia officially gained sovereignty or gained control of west papua they had control but official sovereignty was gained in 1969 and that's when companies international companies could operate some began earlier <laughs> they didn't really care about the international law at all but uh, freeport waited until the official 1969 act of free choice where indonesia officially gained control of west papua i mean the whole vote was a farce in fact there was an article in uh, count uh, counterpunch on the 22nd of January, I think, which, what's her name? Uh, I forget her name now. Um, she, she, uh, the author actually explored the role of the United Nations in that so-called act of free choice. It should have been one man, man one vote, but it, it wasn't. It was, the Indonesians gathered together about 1,023 Papuans and got them to put up their right hand and said, we all vote for the rest of our people, and that's how Indonesia gained officially gained control. One thousand and twenty-three. It's less than one, less than one percent of point one of one percent actually of the uh, of the population who voted. So that's what a farce it was, and uh, it was. Most people in Jakarta now realise it was such a farce, but the UN took note of it, and no one's really lodged an objection in the last 50 years. So it's it's just proceeded and Indonesia's, Indonesia assumed control of the uh, West New Guinea. They called it various names and now it's called uh, Papua, West Papua, and it's just recently been divided into six different provinces. But I think a lot of people in Jakarta are questioning the, the way that it's all been done because it's just not working out. And I've been, I've been trying to tell people in Jakarta uh, to uh, how to improve things, to, uh, to give the Papuans proper, a proper identity, proper recognition. But all of this started with Alan Dulles. So if we get back to him, we can probably get back to the source. Huh? And as I said last night, uh, 
the person who really came close to destroying or disrupting the entire plan that Alan Dulles had since about 1957. He was planning regime change in Indonesia and uh, it, it came about, of course, in 65. But um, the person who threatened that plan of his, that strategy, was da Dag Hammarskjöld, UN Secretary General, who in 1961 was on the verge of proclaiming an end to that sovereignty dispute. And he was going to declare independence for the Papuan people and implement a policy that he'd started in Africa called OPEX, Operational Executive, where newly independent countries, which didn't really have much infrastructure, uh, like you call them fourth world instead of third world, because there was no, no governmental structure at all. And uh, he was, Hammarskjöld's new idea at the time was to uh, bring in about six or seven UN experts, not linked with the United Nations, but uh, under the control of the actual independent government. So they would have been linked with the government in various important departments. And the idea was to get a viable economy so that the, the country would set off in, in, the, in the new era as a, as a successful country. Yeah? And that would be a danger to the American investment into Indonesia with the gold mine, because if that... Uh, yes, if they I mean, they would have had a gold mine to set yeah. off set off their economy wow the biggest gold mine in the world some of the richest oil in, in ever found in the world no no sulfur in this oil when it was finally brought up in 72 it was it, it could be used out of the ground straight into the motor <laughs> incredible no refining needed because it had no sulfur and that was the oil found just before the japanese invasion by um um uh, a, a subsidiary of, of uh, Standard Oil. That's yeah, it goes right back to before the war. Did the pup? Did the people have any education, or did they know that they were sitting on basically? I mean, a, a, a real gold mine. Did they have any idea what they were dealing with, or did you think Alan Dulles or whoever the U.S. government was trying to make sure that they stayed out of the know of what they were actually sitting on? I mean, was the government connected? Very few people knew about that gold. Alan Dulles knew because he formed the company, well, the Rockefeller Company, back in 1935, and it was the gold was discovered in 1936 by Jean-Jacques Dozy, whom I interviewed in his home in the Netherlands in 1982, I think it was. But Kennedy was not informed. Sukarno didn't know. It was the dispute over sovereignty of West New Guinea was really, it, during that dispute, that it claimed that the territory was worthless, it had no natural resources. It's really pathetic, you know, what they said when it's got the richest gold mine in the world. And the, there was a, an overt dispute between the Dutch and the Indonesians, but under the table was another dispute going on between those few Dutchmen who were aware of it. Uh, for example, the foreign minister Luntz, Joseph Luntz, and uh, I think the royal family was probably made aware of it back in 19, back before the war, the Dutch royal family, that is. And on the Indonesian, on the uh, American side was Dulles and uh, Standard Oil was aware of it. General Douglas MacArthur in the war years uh, ch chanced upon the oil, came across the oil, and he there were, uh, I think, uh, geologists were left over after the war for seven or eight years and they did a lot of exploration but I don't think they confirmed they don't think they came across the goal they they discovered uh, uh, nickel 10 percent of world nickel was in one giant deposit on gag island and other things like that but but the gold remained pretty well out of the the contest for for uh, West Papuan sovereignty or West New Guinea sovereignty yeah? That's why you could almost say, what's the crime for Director of Central Intelligence not informing the president of the full details in, in, in something like that? Is it treason? It must be close to treason. It's called because... plausible deniability. He just claims it under that, and then nobody nobody gets a punishment or anything. Yes. So that was the situation facing uh, Kennedy when he came into office. He had to. He had this problem on his desk on his first day. This 
this dispute between Indonesia and the Dutch, and Moscow had already put in, in that period between Kennedy's election and his inauguration, I forget how long it is, what, a month, two months or something, in that period, it had been arranged for a group of Indonesians to go to Moscow to get weapons from Moscow, huge amount of ships and planes, and with with that, with those armaments, they were going to force out the Dutch. And it really was a key feature in Kennedy's decision to uh, not not to stand against Moscow, but really to hand over this country to Sukarno. And then that was half of his deal. And the other half was to bring Indonesia completely on side in the Cold War. That was Kennedy's uh, long-term ambition. And he, but he wasn't able to fulfill that because when he went to Jakarta, as I said, in 19, planning to go to Jakarta in 64, he was prevented from doing that. Huh? Otherwise, history of Indonesia would be totally different. Well, history of America too. Why did uh, the, the UN General Assembly start to look into Dag Hammarskjöld's death? Like when did Dag Hammarskjöld, I know in 60, was this after Lumumba? Like it was 10 weeks after. Yeah, well, Lumumba was, Lumumba was uh, assassinated in uh, uh, the beginning of 1961. And uh, the US Senate investigation, the Church Committee in 1975, found Alan Dulles was primarily responsible for the assassination of Patrice Lumumba. So that's what sparked me to consider the possibility that if Alan Dulles was involved in one in early 61, he might have been involved in later 1961 in the same country, Congo, of Dag Hammarskjöld. And Dag Hammarskjöld was killed in a plane crash. And uh, what really, I, I interviewed Dag, that's in 1980, 82, 83, I interviewed Dag, Hammer, uh, Dag Hammarskjöld's top man, a fellow called George Ivan Smith, who'd retired and was living in a place called Stroud in England. And uh, he told me in great detail what Hammarskjöld's plan was in relation to to West New Guinea. I, I mean, I hadn't heard about that before. It was George Ivan Smith who told me. And uh, it's interesting that the the secret deal, I have to, would have to call it secret, but between Kennedy and Hammarskjöld, because Kennedy didn't want to be publicly involved in the dispute. He wanted the UN to take over. And he, he put Hammarskjöld onto the job of sorting out that dispute between Indonesia and the Netherlands. And the decision that Hammarskjöld made was to kick back both contestants, Indonesia and the Dutch, get rid of them, disqualify them, and then step in and grant independence to the Papuan people. That's that's what his plan was. I mean, this wasn't totally unheard of. I mean, uh, John Foster Dulles, earlier in 1957, had considered granting independence to the Papuan people this horrified his own brother. John Foster was coming up with suggestions like this, much to the horror of Alan Dulles, who had another plan for the country altogether. But Alan wiped that off the map, got got it off the table very quickly. You know, it's hard. It's almost been forgotten that John Foster Dulles first proposed in '57 independence for the Papuan people, but uh, when the time came around in the '60s, they said the Papuans weren't civilized enough to vote. They'd already voted under the Dutch. But the Indonesians claimed they weren't suitable enough to vote. That's why they arranged that that farce in 1969 of 1,000 people putting up their hands. You know, I mean, the people who put up their hands knew that if they if they said no, that they wouldn't live, they wouldn't see the end of the day. Put it that way. But uh, Hammarskjöld's position was, uh, with Kennedy's uh, support, he was going to go ahead with that proposed declaration. But Kennedy didn't want to be seen in public supporting the UN Secretary General at the time because of that squabble over the position of the UN Secretary General was under some dispute because Moscow wanted, or Khrushchev wanted, uh, what he called a troika, a group of three, to replace the position of the one person as Secretary General. He thought that would be a, a more equitable way of, of uh, for the United Nations to be governed. But um, had Hammarskjöld gone ahead, or had Hammarskjöld been able to get back to the General Assembly, he was killed two or three weeks before 
before that was possible. He was killed in the Congo before he returned to make that amazing declaration. And what I'm saying is that this provides a very strong motive for Alan Dulles to be involved in the killing of Doug Hammarskjöld. So do you think he was directly involved or do you think he just got someone to do whatever needed to be done to do the assassination? Oh, directly in as far as he sat in an office in, you know, in Langley and, and uh, well, it was after, wasn't it? He was, he was already out, ousted, Kennedy ousted him in 61, but he still remained in a very powerful position. He, he, went, he kept in the old office, strangely enough, the old CIA office he stayed in and the new office at Langley, he uh, was occupied by the person appointed by Kennedy, yeah? McCone, I think it was. But he, when you say directly involved, ah, he was directly involved in the death of Patrice Lumumba, but he, he didn't actually, he, he, he was in Washington at the time, he just passed orders on what to do. And people in South Africa, well, Africa carried it out. Yeah? The, same, the same operation went into effect in the death of Doug Hammarskjöld, yeah? very similar, in fact, where he said, I, I will give my full support and my people will will uh, help you in your task sort of thing. <laughs> now, did anybody investigate Hammarskjöld's death back then, or is it just recently new? It's a series, several several investigations, right it's straight away from the, uh, from the assassination, day of assassination. And uh, I'm not sure how many, maybe four, five, and the latest of these was uh, prompted by a book by Susan Williams called Who Killed Doug Hammarskjöld, where she she chanced upon uh, um, some very, very strong research looking into a group that was probably involved in the assassination. And as they were, in the, the same group was involved in the assassination of Patrice Lumumba. The, the, order, the instructions were given to the same group to get rid of Doug Hammarskjöld. And some correspondence flowed, and some of this, some of these turned up in letters. Seven or eight letters turned up in the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission held by uh, under the control of Bishop Tutu, 1978, uh, 1997, 98, and he he put on the table for a, in a press conference these letters, one of which contained. Alan Dulley's name and the instructions, we must get rid of Doug Hammarskjöld. You know, he's a trouble, troublesome character, and uh, the method of getting rid of, him, rid of him would be a plane crash. So, I mean, that's exactly what happened. So the involvement of Alan Dulley's uh, was put forward, but up until my book, Chapter 5, in my JFK book, people were focused on the Congo as the only reason or the only motive for the uh, Hammarskjöld's, Hammarskjöld's assassination. But what, what I said in Chapter 5 was, Alan, as soon as Alan Dulles became involved, Alan Dulles supported those persons in the Congo who were capable of, of such, such an act. But Alan Dulles personal motive for getting rid of Dag Hammarskjöld had to do more with the other side of the world. Uh, what Dag Hammarskjöld would have done had he returned to the UN Two weeks later, and the big changes that that would have brought for Alan Dulles's own plans, CIA's plans, Rockefeller's plans, in that part of the world, you know, they've been mining the world's biggest gold mine for the last fifty years now. I mean, I think I saw ten billion was the turnover last year or two two, two years ago. Ten billion, not bad. So, um, Hammarskjöld threatened that. Yeah, so. The reason Hammarskjöld had to be gotten rid of was, I'm saying that's a motive for Alan Dulley's involvement. When when the UN investigation that was concluded last, uh, just after the middle of last year, 2022, the uh, uh, Chief Justice of Tanzania uh, went through some points and picked out from Chapter 5 of my book some details of what Alan Dulley's possible involvement could have been in suggested that this combined with uh, Operation Celeste, which was what uh, Susan Williams found out, which was really the operation to get to assassinate uh, Hammarskjöld, he, uh, he suggested that a new inquiry should be uh, launched. And in the 30th of December, 2022, the UN agreed to proceed with a new inquiry. So 
What will come of that, I don't know, but I do hope that they widen the investigation so that it goes it goes beyond the Congo, because that's the whole point of my claim that Dali's involvement involved somewhere around the other side of the world, Indonesia, and that's why he wanted Alan Dali's, uh, that's why he wanted um, Hammarskjöld out of the picture. So we'll see what happens, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of pressure not to broaden the inquiry beyond the Congo, but once it does go, if it does go beyond the Congo, it will show that Alan Dulles was very deeply involved in quite a few things in Indonesia, regime change, but he's also involved in in 1960, in stopping President Kennedy's visit in 1964. Uh, that's what Dulles in, in November achieved, because had Kennedy made that visit in 64, Dulles would have lost everything that he would have lost in Hammarskjöld and more. The more comes in because in 64, 65, a new uh, political dynamic had entered the scene. That was the, the Sino-Soviet uh, Sino -Soviet dispute had really blown, blown up. Well, 63, it was, it was blowing up, 62, 63. But again, Dulles did not inform President Kennedy, so much so that Kennedy made a public statement saying he's aware the Sino-Soviet dispute, but as far as he understands, it's it's not serious at that stage, and he's going to proceed with uh, foreign policy uh, as though it's it's not a serious issue. However, Dulles at that time had already talked and discussed the whole Sino-Soviet issue. It was real. It was it was exceedingly real, and. It, it was so real that they were starting to argue in public. And Dulles found that one way to get this Sino-Soviet dispute to make it actually explode into, into the point where they actually separated was to exploit their the what each wanted most was to get control of the third biggest communist party in the world, that is the Indonesian Communist Party, onto their side. And that would have given... Moscow or Beijing a relative advantage over the other. If they had 20 million supporters, PKI supporters from Indonesia, it would have uh, yeah, carried the day. So the PKI became an issue in the Sino-Soviet dispute. And this was explained to me in 1983 by former Vice President Adam Malik, yeah, whom I interviewed in his house in uh, in Jakarta, just after he retired, which was a bit extraordinary. But uh, yeah, I got the interview from the godfather of Indonesia, arranged the interview for me. He was Nishijima, a Japanese fellow who knew all these people in the wartime. <laughs> it, it, uh, but anyway, I, the person who had explained the, Sino, the importance of the Sino-Soviet dispute for Indonesia was former Vice President Adam Malik yeah, of Indonesia. And, and because of the at utter destruction of the PKI in Indonesia. Uh, like one million people were killed, more than one million people, another another million incarcerated for many years, hardly without, very few had tr trials. Because of that utter destruction, Moscow and Beijing began armed conflict with each other on the uh, northern on the Sino-Soviet Sino border, you know, up around uh, uh, the Usuri River. And uh, there were massive tank battles, and these were being monitored with U-2 flights at the time. You, the, that is, the CIA was monitoring the severity of the contest. And this is what led eventually to Chairman Mao asking for assistance from President Nixon and Kissinger visited in 1972. There was a stage in Beijing where they were so fearful of, a, of a, an atomic weapon being launched by Moscow towards Beijing that they had practice atomic uh, alarms every day and people on the street in Beijing would all rush underground into into. Uh, uh, bunkers for protection. Huh? It was just practice. But that gives an idea of how serious the Sino-Soviet conflict was getting. They were they were fearful of, of an atomic attack. And that's really what led to uh, the 
I want to take uh, you back the invitation a little bit. for President President Nixon. Yes, you yes, said that's something, really. Well, you said something important. I want to ask about. You said in '64 Kennedy was going to give a speech about the whole like Indonesia thing that was going to mess up kind of Alan Dulles a little bit. Well, Alan, not a speech, a visit, a visit. But Alan Dulles was fired um, by Kennedy. Yeah, '61. Yeah. yeah. So, so is he still connected somehow, or is that, are you looking at it like more of a legacy thing? No, 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 no. He was still very powerful, as. Uh, Devil's chessboard still explained, huh? and in fact, I think he said uh, on the day of the assassination, Alan Dulles was in the CIA bunker headquarters outside Langley. <laughs> so, the point was after Alan Dulles was fired by Kennedy, kicked out, Alan used to go along to the old CIA headquarters in Foggy Bottom in Washington. And he stayed there. These these were the old CIA headquarters. He didn't move out, basically. Whereas the new Langley headquarters, which Alan himself had designed, and but he never occupied them. So they were they were they became the new CIA headquarters. But Alan maintained a presence in the old ones, and also a presence in uh, Sullivan and Cromwell, the legal office for well, one of the. One of the the biggest is it on on Wall Street? One of the biggest, <laughs> and also the front front lobby desk, the, the the desk for Rockefeller Oil basically is Sullivan and Cromwell. Yeah? It was run by former, it used to be run by uh, John Foster Dulles as the top lawyer, and Allen was the 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 other main lawyer. Allen was the European lawyer, and uh, John Foster, of course, had married into the Rockefeller family, so. And but Alan was the uh, the uh, what do you call him the sharpshooter the best the best lawyer that that ever had by a long way. Now will this mess up more than just the CIA's credibility with a director like uh, Alan Dulles still being connected even though he was no longer in his position of power? But this hints to something bigger, which is the whole what we all talk about the monopoly with the Rockefellers and all that type of situation that's going on. Well, when they yeah, like the position of director of Central Intelligence. CIA is just one group, isn't it? There's, there's about how many other intelligence agencies are there? About eight or nine uh, serious ones. I mean, he's also in charge of that. He had lots of connections, lots of links, lots of. Uh, but more than that, Alan Dulles began intelligence the in the field of intelligence. He began in in World War One, and he had he had contacts going back to World War One. Not, it wasn't just his connections in the 1950s, like like uh, the uh, George de Moran Shield, who was a key wit witness in the Warren Commission, who uh, whose whose wife was the uh, I mean he was Russian himself, but um, George George de Moran Shield actually met Alan Dulles when George was a young boy about. Eight years of age, in the Baku oil fields, Alan Dulles came over after World War One to renegotiate an oil treaty in the Baku oil fields from Constantinople, and he, the person he was dealing with was George's father, who was in charge of the Baku oil fields, which at that time were under before the uh, uh, revolution, Russian Revolution, was under the control of the Tsar, and George's father had been appointed by the Tsar to run these enormous oil fields so when the red when the uh, revolution occurred he was out and young george george de morenshield went went back to poland for a year or two as a cavalry, cavalry officer belgium he did a phd and then immigrated to america just before world war ii and uh, got a job in uh, humble oil which was a subsidiary of Standard Oil, run by the Bush crew, by the way. Yeah. Those good old connections popping up everywhere. Look, there's only so many coincidences before you have to start being like, okay, all right, something, something fishy is going on here. <laughs> yeah, well, that's George George de Morin Shield is a very interesting person, of course. But um, hey, we got to talk the about other when, thing I was going to about. I'm about to say we got to talk about Hammershall's death because a lot of people out there listening don't even know exactly what happened when his plane crashed, when it took off, how they even got to his plane. Well, after the death of Patrice Lumumba, there was instability in the Congo. 
and there was a breakaway province, Katanga, and fighting began. UN troops were called in. There was some shooting, killing, and Dagamashol decided, as the Secretary General, he had personal responsibility, so he decided to visit in person and do try to mediate this this dispute. So he flew over uh, in seventeenth, was it sixteenth? And the plane la- on the on the uh, the place where the plane left Elizabethville, I forget the name of the place, where it left from, and it it left. Uh, in the evening it left because the previous day coming in it had been attacked by well harassed not shot at but harassed by a small fighter plane and uh because of that harassment it was decided that the plane should be checked over before the final flight so four technicians were appointed to check over the plane and i'm saying that quite possibly one of those technicians was able to fiddle with the altimeter and One you or, said when we talked yesterday that Hoover said that the altimeters were fine. Yeah, but that was up there. Somebody fiddled with the altimeters. The plane took off at midnight. It crashed just after midnight. And 16, 16 people were killed. One a bit later. But uh, when the security guard died a few days later in hospital. But basically everybody was killed. The, the first thing, there were as the plane was coming into land, there were two CIA planes on the Indola tarmac that's where the destination was for the plane to land Indola and there were two CIA planes on the tarmac already one of which at midnight had all its engines operating was was a communications plane state-of-the-art communications and everything was operating at midnight who were they communicating with (laughs) at midnight and I mean of course there I we can say quite possibly they were intercepting calls or they were communicating with the small fighter plane that was harassing Hamishol's plane as it was coming into land, which was a considerable influence, I think, in causing the crash. I think the uh, but because of that distraction and possibly the altimeter as well, it clipped into the into a uh, into the treetops at about four and a half thousand feet. I think it, it, it had just if the altimeter had just been 500 feet adjusted it could have caused that crash yeah and uh, there were other irregularities that seemed to point towards the altimeter but first thing that happened when they found the crash the following afternoon which was a long time to find it was the altimeters were ripped out sent back to america checked and the person who gave the go-ahead that they were working in full working condition was j edgar hoover now the un a report last year that came out last year uh, agreed with my conclusion that the, we may have respected J. Edgar Hoover in the 1960s, but in 2022, his his, uh, his light seems to have faded a bit, and uh, we're less we're less inclined to believe everything that he spoke was was the gospel truth. Huh? <laughs> so I was suggesting that perhaps if they if it's possible at all to to find the original uh, altimeters or the original report on those altimeters, did J. Edgar Hoover, was he telling the truth when he said they're full working condition or not? You know, that needs to be checked. The name of the technician needs to be checked. There's, a, there's a quite a few points yeah, that, that need to be uh, uh, reinvestigated, at least. And the, the uh, some of the points that brought, were brought up by Susan Williams are really key issues as well. Uh, with just re uh, reinvestigating Operation Celeste, which was the the name of the operation that uh, this intelligence group in South Africa was called. Oh well, they, they gave the name for the for the operation to wipe out Hammerschild. That's what they called it. So, yeah, the the point about Hammerschild is that I, he was he came into power. He was elected as the UN Secretary General. They thought he was going to be a, a meek and mild uh swedish swedish person but he ended up being quite a, an independent thinker and uh he he was formulating a a new policy really in the middle of the cold war he had no time at all for the cold war and what he was doing in south africa was 
independent countries were coming on the scene very rapidly. And he was basically forming a third group in the United Nations of newly independent countries. You know? I mean, there's, there's, I think there were 20 or 30 already in Africa, and we're going to be another as many again in the next few years. So they would have been a considerable lobby group, a considerable force within the United Nations that would have been uh, strongly influenced to, to vote that in the way that Hammarskjöld really was pursuing, that is, helping the helping the poorer people in the world rather than uh, the Rockefellers, uh, trying to trying to get them above uh, poverty level, basically. When I say helping, it's, it's most of them are living in poverty, yeah, with no infrastructure at all. Sorry? Do you think this will open up the door to look into Hale Boggs' death? Like, I never put a lot of weight into Hale Boggs' death, but I think what I told you yesterday was in 1971, there's an interview with him um, where he's calling out, well, yeah, well, his plane crash was in 72, but in 71, he gives a speech um, about asking for Hoover's retirement, basically. He's saying that the FBI is not only wiretapping congressmen and there's all this type of stuff. And the reporter literally goes, what's your evidence on that? And he was like, I, this is all I can say about this right now, but trust me, the truth is going to come out. Um, there's been domestic surveillance on congressmen and all this type of stuff. And then uh, he gives no more statements and he gets up and leaves. Now, afterwards, uh, Earl Warren pulls Hale Boggs aside and says, you can't talk like that about J. Edgar Hoover, like telling him, like, basically straightens him out. Like, hey, you can't say anything about the FBI like that. But one of the things he says in his speech, and everyone can watch the video, it's on YouTube. They go, what's the problem with the investigation? And he goes, well, you're asking the FBI to investigate the FBI. Like, they're not you're not going to get answers and it was like this moment where it was like huh and then in 72 his airplane crashes and there's no parts yeah, found nothing like yeah, that yeah. yeah so i mean in 74 everything he was saying in that video came to light so at the time they didn't believe him and then there was more belief in it after watergate and everything like that so and after hoover yeah, died yeah, yeah. Uh, yes well uh, hoover had been monitoring congressmen for decades hadn't he <laughs> he got his job blackmailing people. He would sit out in front of motels and watch big politicians go in, and that's how he had blackmailing people. So he got his start that way, and then eventually – I mean, look, you're in a position like the FBI. He wanted to be the world police basically, and um, you, there's no way that that power doesn't corrupt you or turn you into a hard individual. Now the issue starts to become as if we talk about – domestic assassination plots not only with stuff we know about COINTELPRO and things of that sort but we're actually talking about political leaders that were creating problems and that's when you start to realize your intelligence agencies have been starting to go down this down uh this bad path and they haven't been corrected as such when i mentioned those television debates debates that uh, between nixon and kennedy before and and uh alan dulles was as I said, was one of the well, he was the first person employed in the in the Kennedy administration. J. Edgar Hoover was with him at the same time. They were the first two in the Kennedy administration, and it's as I yeah, it's, it's a stark well, it sounds, contrast it, with. It sounds counterintuitive, and I think this is kind of my perspective on it: is that Kennedy was new to office, and if you look through so much documentation through the FBI's documentation. Even Nixon knew that he had to talk to J. Edgar Hoover about all the stuff that was coming out that he needed squashed, and Hoover said no. But he knew that he had to go through Hoover to get the FBI to follow suit because they all respected their director, J. Edgar Hoover. Now, when he didn't do that, Nixon created his own FBI and everything of that sort. That's the only reason I can see that Kennedy would want to get Hoover and Alan Dulles on his support side or in his administration in the very beginning is because they already hold so much weight and so much water that all the rest of the agencies that follow these directors were going to come follow suit as well, too. And he's a new guy on the blocks. So you would think that would make a lot of sense. It's just later, I think he realized how much they wanted to be the stardom, much like Nixon thought, since I'm the president, I can do whatever the hell I want. These people work for me and then he found out pretty quick that that's not how it works these agencies work by themselves and you're just kind of a figurehead so i think that has a lot more weight to it than like um i mean it explains the situation of why kennedy would even want dulles and hoover on there in the first place he started to notice that how powerful they were he even called for hoover's retirement uh and you know you could say is hoover gonna let that happen i don't know it didn't seem like it and alan dulles too i mean alan dulles got fired and then he was sitting on a cia farm basically there was a bit of personal animosity as well between hoover and hammerschold i think when uh in the late 
50s, what, 58 or something. Uh, apparently Hoover had put some of the G-men into the uh, United Nations building there up on all, running around at all levels. And when Hammarskjöld found out this was happening, he forced them all out of the building. He got them all out of the building. And that was, yeah, that caused a, a few uh, a few feathers were ruffled then. And uh, Hoover didn't didn't like didn't like Hammarskjöld at all after that. Well, perhaps before, but definitely not after. But the main issue that the United Nations is now facing with this re new inquiry, as of the 30th of December 2022, a new inquiry into the death of Hammarskjöld, is that if they start looking at it uh, as a, in terms of did Alan Dulles have a motive, they will have to look at what Alan Dulles' motive was in Indonesia to cause such a tragedy for Hammarskjöld eh? and what Hammarskjöld was planning to do in New Guinea. And at the same time, if they do that, it's it's almost like a, a preface for a, a further investigation because the similarities in motive between Alan Dulles getting rid of Hammarskjöld and Alan Dulles getting rid of President Kennedy, uh, they're all there again, except, as I said, with Ken in the case of Kennedy, you had the the added incentive for Dulles to act because you had the Sino-Soviet conflict and President Kennedy's visit to Jakarta would have disrupted that that possibility for Dulles to eliminate the PKI and thereby thereby lose the potential for really sparking the conflict between uh, Moscow and Beijing. Yeah? And I think that's possibly how he may have got the Joint Chiefs of Staff on side to agree to uh, to try to stop or to agree to stop Kennedy's visit to Jakarta. Because, you know, the, all the discrepancies you know, on the day of the assassination and for weeks afterwards, you know, people in high places doing weird things. And, I mean, the Joint Chiefs were really uh, supporting uh, not... Uh, they're not being too open with what uh, what Kennedy's side family would have wanted, I think. So um, the the position of Alan Dulles then was he had to act, or in, in the case of Kennedy or the case of Hammarskjöld, he had to act. Otherwise, his years and years of strategy and planning would just go down the drain. And then Hammarskjöld was eliminated. Kennedy himself had to step into the breach and take over. That is, that is, he had to. Uh, mediate or step into the uh, dispute between the Dutch and the Indonesians and he decided in favour of Sukarno you know, because the alternative was to have conflict, superpower conflict with Moscow which he didn't want but then as I said the other half of Kennedy's arrangement was to follow up with massive civic aid to bring Indonesia in total on side. Sukarno was wanted that. He, he he and Kennedy got along quite well. And uh, there were, Kennedy was going to uh, put in civic aid in a in a big way, using sometimes the Indonesian army to do it as well. Not just US aid, but the Indonesian army. And that would have uh, improved the living standards of so many Indonesian uh, peasants, Patani, they call them, rice growers, uh, that the CIA, the PKI, sorry, would have lost their uh, support base. And, but as I said, would have taken several years. And Dulles, Alan Dulles wanted to exploit this potential for disrupting Beijing and, and Moscow immediately. And to do that, they, they eliminated the, the struggle to, uh, well, the, the tragedy of eliminating the PKI in Indonesia was the way to do it. And it sparked this conflict between Moscow and Beijing, which was pointed out in an interview conducted by former US Ambassador Marshall Green, who was ambassador from 1965 to 69, I think, and uh, in Jakarta. And a few years before he passed away, about 25 years later, he made a Library of Congress interview where he said, People still don't understand what amazing things we achieved in Indonesia. You know, we 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 helped to split Moscow and Peking with 
with what happened in Indonesia in 1965-66. He says this in an interview, you know, but he also says people don't understand yet. They, they haven't come to grips with the history that took place. It's sort of bypassed everybody and it's been really kept off. They're kept out of discussion levels as well because it's involved with quite a lot of nasty things that have happened in Indonesia, such as... You know, the supplying guns as well too that the guns on the airport strip yes and that's i think one of the reasons i yeah this is just supposition but why indonesia is not so well known i mean american tourists go there in fairly small numbers mainly europeans but um why only 10 percent of americans know about indonesia i don't know I, it's, I shouldn't say that because Australia is not much better, really. We're right next door. You know, you still get Australian tourists going to Bali, and I've heard them on the planes going home. Oh, did you like your visit to Indonesia? I'd ask. You know, no, no, we didn't go to Indonesia. We went to Bali. <laughs> I mean, Bali's a Hindu enclave in Indonesia, right? Well, even with India, the only reason we have the information we have on India is because the amount of people like in the U.S., for instance, there are some people that come over from India over here or come over from Guyana. It's the only reason we know about those countries is from stories or experiences of people like I, some of my friends are from Guyana or something like that from Central America or something where it's like that's where we get our info. I think the main focus in politics happens to be some of the most supreme powers, which is what's going on in Russia recently, what's going on in Ukraine, things going on in China. We don't know anything about North Korea, even though everyone talks about it. We have no idea what they're doing over there. So I think if if the UN investigation is, is limited to uh, just looking at the Congo again, it, it won't come up with any 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 real motives for Dalis, which is they're on the other side of the world. But on the bright side, on the brighter side, if it does consider the proper motive motive for Dalis being involved in the assassination of Dag Hammarskjöld, it will then open quite a few windows, and it should lead on to Kennedy's involvement in Indonesia as well. Yeah? Of course, Kennedy and Hammarskjöld had an a, a, a deal going for Hammarskjöld to uh, in, uh, interfere, I suppose, in the dispute, mediate the dispute or end the dispute between Netherlands and the, Indonesia. And Kennedy really would have supported that openly uh, had he made that announcement the, in the UN General Assembly, but he was never able to do it. I wonder if it will actually break out of the Congo, though. I feel like it, it, if they can try and isolate it to a Congo type thing, then not go into Indonesia or anything like that. I mean, what's future business aspects that are going on in Indonesia that could possibly be ruined if it came out that there was an assassination thing and there might be a lot of involvement with Alan Dulles in Indonesia? Like everything that we know now, Lumumba, a bunch of stuff in Africa, a bunch of stuff in Ecuador, stuff that's known maybe not super publicly known but it's already been exposed i feel like they're going to try and keep the problem there instead of trying to expand it out like oh there's new evidence of something going on in indonesia that they don't want that happening the government wouldn't want that answer one of the ways perhaps to um help people to understand the importance of indonesia is to to look a little bit at indonesian history and simply by saying as george kahin said Indonesia was the world's richest colony in the days of in the colonial days. Indonesia was was really the as good as you can get. And uh, in terms of richness for the, the the mother country, that is the colonial country, the Netherlands, it kept Amsterdam the financial capital of the world for 150 years. That's where all those beautiful, been to Amsterdam, <laughs> all those beautiful canals in Amsterdam and all the little bridges. That, it's all built on, well, the wealth from the Indies. Huh? And some of the uh, the huge buildings along the, the waterway, which have been converted now into apartment buildings. But if you look inside them, some of the, some of the timber, ginormous pieces of, timber you know which go into the structure of the original big big sheds you know like the half a mile long some of these sheds and the the timber is just amazing timber from 200 years ago and uh it's all 
it's all the wealth, of, a lot of it is the wealth of the Indies or other parts of other parts of the world where they got the timber from. I mean, Churchill's grandfather, I think, made his millions uh, with uh, teak from Burma. Eh? That's where that's where he got his original money from. But uh, uh, the the others, I should talk some more, I suppose, about what Kennedy was planning to do with it was Indonesia to bring it on side in the Cold War, and that was thwarted by what began in early 1963, confrontasi, confrontation between Indonesia and Malaysia. And because of that period of confrontation, which was, I mean, Malaysia was uh, a British colony and Britain was an ally of USA, and that's eventually why the Cong US Congress stopped President Kennedy's aid for Indonesia, flying to Indonesia. They said, we're not going to support Sukarno if he's if he's conducting uh, semi-warfare with uh, with Britain and or Malaysia. You know? So they stopped Kennedy's uh, aid for Indonesia. And in desperation, Kennedy decided he will have to go to Jakarta in early 64. And together with Sukarno, and they both agreed on it, that they would stop confrontation and thereby Kennedy was going to open the doors again for US aid to flow to, Ind flow to Indonesia so that he would be able to complete his Indonesia strategy in time to be re-elected. But unless, if he, unless he got Indonesia working, he, wouldn't, he would not have been re-elected. It would have been a, considered a massive failure. But <clears throat> what he didn't realize was that Alan Dulles was interfering with Kennedy's plans for getting Indonesia on side, you see. Alan Dulles actually had a CIA man from Singapore hand over 2,000 small arms weapons to a communist underground group in Sarawak. And this was the group that fled into Indonesian territory and got support from Jakarta. And that's how confrontation began in 1963. And yet, you read all the history books and you'll see the person who started confrontation was President Sukarno. No, it wasn't. President Sukarno was very uh, anti-colonial, but he didn't start confrontation in 63. In 64 and 65, he was promoting confrontation. But in 63, he tried to stop confrontation up to the point where Kennedy was assassinated. And I've got that in writing from Dean Rusk. When Dean Rusk retired, Secretary of State went to Athens in Georgia, I think it was. He, I was writing to him for several years, and he wrote a letter to me confirming that the deal that President Kennedy made with President Sukarno was that he's going to visit on condition that confrontation was stopped, not just for the day, he said, but for forever, for good. And that would then open the doors again for US aid from, from America to Jakarta. And that would implement, uh, help to implement Kennedy's Indonesia plan, Indonesia strategy. It would have got him reelected, but he, he never made it to Jakarta. Same way that Hammarskjöld never made it back to the General Assembly. Mm. Has there been any other names that have been mentioned besides Can uh, Kennedy and Hammarskjöld? Any other? Other Sorry. names that have been mentioned, uh, people visiting Indonesia, anything like that of that sort. I would have to think before they straight up knock you off that there would be some type of warning or some type of message that they'd be sending. Like maybe you should avoid looking into Indonesia or something of that sort. Mm -hmm. uh, not sure. It's, it's, uh, it seems to me an endless tragedy really that that whole dispute between the Dutch and the Indonesians over a piece of land, the western half of New Guinea, which went on for all the 1950s up to 62, and it was always described as a wasteland, a useless land, without any natural resources, you know, when in reality it was, Nixon referred to it obliquely as the richest piece of real estate in the world, you know, when he found out it's got the biggest gold mine, the richest oil, it's got this, it's got whatever, nickel, wah. Incredible wealth. And what a great lie the world was told in the 1950s 
when when they said, oh, it's just, you know, the Papuans live there and it hasn't got any natural resources, you know, my goodness. And people think that people think of the Papuans, they think of Michael Rockefeller disappeared, never seen again. They said they're eaten by cannibals. Yeah. And that's part of the reason why why people never supported Papuan independence. You know, they said, oh, they're cannibals, you know. But I mean, even General Nasution, head of the Indonesian army, told me that is complete nonsense, that story, you know. Rockefeller was 23, 24 kilometers out to sea. They think and he couldn't see, couldn't see the land at all, you know. And I interviewed the man he was with, Rene Wasink. And he said, there's no land visible anywhere. Rockefeller swam, but he's swimming the wrong direction anyway. He was swimming against the current, and the current was running parallel to the coast. He wasn't swimming towards the coast. And yet when you read their books by, what's his name? He wrote a book five years ago, something Harvest. Huh? It gives you the impression that Rockefeller, the boat that Rockefeller turned over in was a few hundred metres offshore and he swam ashore. No, it was, it was way, it was swam, the boat drifted out all afternoon, all night. And in the morning, Rene Wassing said, we could not even see land anywhere. And he remember him going around with his, he was worked in a museum at the time. He, he performed this big arm, arm length demonstration saying no land anywhere, you know, and he's almost crying because he felt, he felt so responsible for the whole tragedy. He tried to stop Rockefeller from leaving the boat, he said, but he couldn't. Huh? He was panicking. The young fellow was panicking. Could he swim? Or he did, swam did off. He... Swam. Sorry? Could he swim? Yeah, he's a good swimmer. Yeah, good swimmer. But he's swimming the wrong direction. And he had very thick glasses. But he was swimming parallel. He was swimming against the current, thinking the current was the river that pushed them out. But the river goes out then goes parallel to the coast. They're 25k out to sea. And there were sharks, apparently, as well. They, that afternoon, Rockefeller left in the morning, never seen again. But in the afternoon, Dutch planes came over and dropped a life raft and Rene Wassing had to clamber from the upside down boat into a life raft. And he said it wasn't very far away. They got it quite close to the boat. But even that small distance, he said he was terrified of sharks. He must have seen sharks. And then he was hanging onto the lifeboat in the water. And he didn't have enough strength to lift himself in, you know. But when he he told me when he thought of sharks, he just jumped in. <laughs> He got in straight away, yeah. So that that's another complete tragedy. That's another big lie surrounding Papua that Rockefeller was eaten on the beach with Sago, you know. You still get that coming up today. It's amazing. Do you think it was a lie to keep them from looking into what was going on over there? Do you think it was a lie to keep the guy's credibility instead of, you know, getting eaten by cannibals a better death than getting eaten by sharks? Uh, well, yeah. But uh, by... Labeling the Papuans as cannibals, you know, they said, oh, they're not in, they're capable of independence, governing themselves, you know. I mean, it's like picking a beggar in New York Street and saying, oh, this person can't govern America, you know. I mean, they pick the lowest, lowest strata of society and say that person's not capable of running a country. Well, probably right, you know. Same as somebody, uh, somebody in the street in New York who's been yeah, uneducated, whatever, for years. He, he's not he's not a person you pick to go into the White House. You know, it's the same logic. But there are some very bright Papuans. One of them, well, a high school student a few years ago, they had a high school competition in mathematics and physics, and it was held in Poland, a world competition. And this Papuan out of the <laughs> he won the competition. Amazing. So they they've got an ex. So extra skill in mathematics and whatever. When I when he got a job uh, later with BP in in uh, New Guinea, and it's British Petroleum, like getting big gas deposits in New Guinea, some of the world's biggest gas deposits as well. But uh, I asked him, okay, you work Monday to Friday. W what do you do on the weekend? You know, oh, he said I jump in the canoe and go over to that village over there and I teach them maths and physics. <laughs> <laughs> that's why that's why you get the Papuans good at maths and physics for some reason. Huh? They seem to have an ability in that in that area for I don't know why. But uh interesting interesting uh possibilities with Papa because I think there is a 
slowly a change occurring in Jakarta that they realize they can't just pursue the army way of solving the problem by killing the problem. You know, there are certain persons in Jakarta who think, no, we must sit down, negotiate, and work out a work out a way to go forward rather than just use guns all the time because they've been using guns for, since the 1960s and the death toll for the Papuan people is really horrendous if you want to work it out. I, I once worked out uh, going back from 1960 to 2004, uh, I worked out a, a way of calculating by comparing the population growth with nearby Papua New Guinea with West New Guinea because they're the same culture, the same approximate size of family and things. And the number of people missing in West New Guinea, that is the populations that's not there, the deficit, is, is roughly akin to the, the number involved in the Armenian genocide. Now, that is that is just horrific. And when I go along to Jakarta and I meet you know, various um, Indonesian ambassadors and politicians and people and try to explain to them what is happening in West Papua, Half of them don't even know. They they don't care. They live in Jakarta, and it's like three thousand kilometers away. You know, it's a long distance away. But when I try to explain that this 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 horrendous killing is going on in West Papua, that they should sit down and do something to stop it, but nobody seems keen to do it. It's just too difficult. And the people are Papuan. They're not Muslim. They're Christians. They're black. They're not. In, they're not Indonesian. They're Melanesian, and there's just this absolute lack of interest. And sometimes you get. I remember one who was the ambassador from Indonesian ambassador from London or something. He was visiting Jakarta. He said, "Oh, don't worry about the past. You know, think of the future." Oh yes, yeah. Well, it's difficult to think of the future when so many people and your relatives and friends have are gone. You know? I told him about. Uh, 1977 in the Highlands, when three, no, four Bronco planes, uh, you know, Bronco planes from from Vietnam, they were they were brought down to Wamena, and uh, it was non-stop bombing occurred for three months in Wamena. A Dutch doctor who was there estimated, you know, something like 20, 25,000. He said 75,000. 75% of one tribe was eliminated. And in total numbers, people have put forward numbers like 25 or 30,000 people that were killed. And when I bring this to the attention of people in Jakarta, you know, various generals or whatever, they just don't want to know. They deny it. They just say it didn't happen, you know. Like some generals deny that people were killed in 1965-66 in Java, you know. They just deny it. Where show me show me where they where they're buried, you know? Things ridiculous response, you know. Well, you Not know the US government deny, deny, deny. Yeah, work out a way of dealing with it. Otherwise, Indonesia's going to have this terrible burden for years until it's resolved. You know? I mean, the example I usually give in Indonesia is the the Irish example between the the, the fighting in Northern Ireland, which went on for centuries, you know has been going on for centuries, the green and the orange, whatever, until finally they sit down at a table and say, we acknowledge this has happened, you know, and let's try to find a way for the future to work it out. And Indonesia has to do this with New Guinea, with West New Guinea or West Papua, or whatever they call it. They've just divided it up into six new, six, six provinces. It was two provinces before. Now it's six. So it's just divide and rule, and they're pouring in more troops, and that's not going to solve the problem. They're they're just adding to the problem, and they don't seem to see it. And they've they've even withheld people from United Nations coming in to conduct uh, reviews. It's it's totally out of order. And uh, I don't know. Some somebody. I don't think the United Nations is going to intervene, but. Um, Hopefully they all, they do manage to get a, a representative in there to to make some assessment of human rights and things, but other than that, uh, I'm not sure what what I can do in telling people in Jakarta doesn't seem to be progressing.
Mm. You're doing a lot. I mean, talking about it with me on my show and then talking about it in general and writing about it as well, too. I mean, you're educating newer people to look into that. So, you know, hopefully we get some answers on Hammersholt's death and then maybe that'll cause an investigation to look deeper into Indonesia. Yes, yes, it should. Uh, if the uh, if they do investigate that in a rigorous way, <laughs> uh, it will lead to a closer inspection of situation in Indonesia in the 60s. And part of that will be JFK. Mm. Well, Greg, I appreciate the time you gave me to talk on my show, man. You're always welcome back on here. I'm glad we got the chat again. Um, and thank you for you know pointing me some resources on Hammershot as well, too. Um, but where can people find your links, man? My links, my email, you mean? Well, you can say your email or where people can find your books. I'm going to link it all in there anyway. Uh, well, the JFK book should be, uh, you have to contact uh, Amazon online. That's basically, or, or what's the other one? Uh, book, 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 Booktopia, is it? What's the name? One of those Bookopedia? distribution. Yeah, Bookpedia, yeah. But it's uh, yeah online, Amazon. Or I did listen to the uh, audio book at one stage. They've got an audio book as well. It's some American fellow with a very cl clearly spoken voice. I think he does it quite well. It's the first audio book I've ever listened to, but I was quite pleased with his voice, the way he expresses the story as it progresses, yes. And it works quite well listening like that. If you're going along in a car and you put on the audio, it's uh, it's a good way to listen to it. And it's, you know, it costs $5 or something. It's it's quite a cheap uh, way of buying the, uh, the book. The other, the hard copy book bought online, Amazon is... 20 or 30 dollars or something yeah it's it's not like the some academic books which you know 140 dollars you know, and uh few people read them i was just think that uh if people could even though it's condensed i the publisher wanted me to bring it down from sort of this size to this size and it is condensed but i hope i hope people if people have any questions i usually say don't hesitate to to contact me i suppose they can easily find my email but uh, I've had quite quite a number of people in USA contacting me over this point or that point, and I heard one. Where was that? In Texas, I think some local journalist there was having a town meeting about my book. <laughs> I, was just, I was thrilled to hear that they were discussing it in in the public hall. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, so. Well I'm going to link all your links in the description. Um, I'll, I'll include your email in there as well, too, in case anybody wants to contact you with any questions. Um, Greg, it's always a pleasure chatting with you, man. And thanks for listening to this episode of Out of the Blank Podcast.